You know, it's true that sometimes we are a product of our environment. The environment, the community that we're raised in really does play a significant part in our own formation and development. I was fortunate, um, really blessed to have been raised in a Christian home, having been exposed to the things of God in an early age, to, to, to church, to the Word of God, and to many a kids' church lessons that really set a, um, a precedence, kind of a foundation, a strong foundation for faith in my life. Um, but there was a season, just an itty bitty season there during my teenage years where my faith took a real back seat. Uh, I turned from God. The things of God just weren't a real priority in my life. And so eventually my attitude, my character, my choices began to reflect as much. Uh, I remember one particular night I was 18 years old. Did you hear me say I was 18 years old? All right, just give me a little grace here. I was out with my, my mate. Uh, he was 18 as well. We'd just been to the movies, so it wasn't anything crazy. We weren't, we weren't inherently bad, but we'd just seen an action-packed movie. I'm pretty sure it had Vin Diesel in it. It was kind of the era. At 10.30 at night, finished, and it was time to go home. So we, we jumped in the car. Back then, it was a Daewoo Cielo. Anyone got a Daewoo? Yeah. If they're still running today, that's a modern-day miracle. I mean, that's... I mean, someone once accurately said about Daewoo is if they run in the day, woo, that's, you'll get it later. Anyway, so we're driving home. I jump on Brisbane Road. I lived in Pacific Pines at the time. I'm heading towards the highway. And we got over a little crest there where the milk factory is in the gym. And it begins a stretch of long, straight stretch of road. And we're just cruising. I'm driving. My mate's next to me. And all of a sudden, this car comes flying up next to us and just stays, just holds the pace. And so it gets our attention. And we look over. And it's a car full of adolescent pubescent juveniles. Um, the same as us, really. A car loaded full of 18-year-olds. And, um, and they're carrying on like pork chops. Like, our windows are up. We got the air con. At least the day we had running air con. And their windows are down, and they're spitting and screaming. And, and it was kind of muffled. Um, we didn't speak sign language, but we were pretty sure we were picking up what they were putting down. And um, at one point, I noticed that one of the chaps in the back seat closest to our car was drinking a two-liter bottle of fizzy drink. And he was sort of drooling and letting it, you know, run out of his mouth and just being silly. We're carrying along and um, my hand's on the wheel. And, and this is why it's so important that you have a right perspective of your own identity. Because in that moment, I didn't see myself as a six-foot, white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid. I saw myself as dark, tan, muscular, like Vin Diesel. And so I'm driving along with my, my hand on the wheel and I'm just giving this guy the look. You know, like the Vin Diesel, I, give, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. You, know, you, want, you want to go? You want to do this? Let's, let's do it. I didn't say that, obviously. You couldn't hear, but that's the look I was giving him. And um, all of a sudden, we hear this thud, just this almighty bang that ricochets through my day with Cielo. And I instinctively know that this lunatic in the back seat drinking his two-liter bottle of fizzy drink has just launched it at my car. And it, with that sort of noise, it's definitely dinged the rear quarter panel. And this wasn't my car. This was the old family car, but it hadn't officially been deposited to me yet. And so I knew that I'm going to have to go home and explain this whole thing to my stepdad, who was a lunatic. So I was angry. You know, I was mad as a cut snake, just cruising along. And now I'm all up, upset and enraged. And, and I, the, the idea came to me. I would love to just drive my car straight into his and send him off the road. I had the idea. I didn't follow through. Let me make that clear. But what I did do in the moment as I'm, I'm looking at this guy, I just kind of followed through with the actions as, as if I was, but I didn't. So I kind of just looking at him, just turned my, my, my hands, slipped them around the wheels. And the chap must have thought I was legit because all of a sudden the car just disappears. It just vanishes. And we're like, what happened? I look in the rearview mirror and he's literally hit the anchors and turned at the same time. So his whole car is spun around. All I could see was the, is his headlights go vroom, vroom. And we, it was a kind of a, a slight moment of panic between my mate and I. We thought, oh my gosh, did we, you know, did we hurt them? Like, this was really bad. And then we noticed he'd picked it up and we thought, that was pretty funny. We kept going. We thought we were pretty tough, didn't we? We get along. We're about um, in line with the Arundel State School. All of a sudden, I see this car flying up on our tail. And he gets right up to the boot of my car. He's so close to our boot that I can't even see his headlights. I can just see through his windscreen into the, the lot of larrikins um, inside the car. And I had a moment um, where I thought, I should probably turn the other cheek. You ever been there? But I'm Vin Diesel in this moment, so that ain't going to happen. And I keep cruising along, and I know that United Fuel Station's coming up, and there's a little um, exit into a residential area. I think some of you live there. Um, hopefully not 18 years ago, if so, I'm sorry. Um, but I think to myself, I'm going to pull off into this little street and 
I'm going to allow them an opportunity to keep going. I'm going to be the bigger person here. Let's see what happens. But if he follows me, I'm going full Vin Diesel on this. I'm like, this is going to happen. <laughs> so I come up to this exit and I, and I pull in and sure enough, they follow. So I floor it and I create a little bit of distance and I hit the anchors and I open the door. I get out of my car and I start walking towards my boot. This car comes screaming up to us, headlights in my face. I can't see a whole lot, but all I can see or make out is a silhouette. I see all four of these doors open. All five of these guys jump out and two in the back are carrying something long and quite rigid. And I know it's quite firm because as he's getting out, he kind of hits his car and there's a thud. And I think, well, that's a baseball bat. And that's a baseball bat bat too. I'm out of here. So I turn around, I ran back to my car. My mate thought he was going to be Vin Diesel too. He starts getting out and said, no, bro, get in. Let's go, let's go. Somehow I managed to spin the front wheels of this day with Chiello. But in the, in, the, uh, in the holdup, one of the guys has launched a baseball bat into the back of our Chiello. That's how we got that ding, mum. I don't think she knows the story. And we go flying. And I instinctively know, I've been in this residential area before, that all roads lead to a dead end. There's no way through. There's only one way in and there's one way out. We're on the main road and I know it kind of caresses, arcs around the corner into a cul-de-sac. And I'm thinking, man, these guys are going to pin us in as we get down there. And they're going to get out and give us the beat down of our lifetime. So I'm starting to panic. I'm really starting to fear here. A moment ago, I thought it was Vin Diesel. Now I'm hoping my mum's somewhere in the area and she can come and save us. And then I had a Holy Spirit moment. And I know it was the Holy Spirit because I was too worked up to have any kind of rational, wise thought. The thought comes to me, find an empty car space between lampposts so there's not immediate light, pull in, turn the car off, turn the lights off, get off the brake. Because, you know, when you get on the brake, sometimes the car's off, it still pings the red light, gives your location away. So I'm like, that's brilliant. I'm flying along and there's just cars in every driveway. And then, like, this one driveway is empty. And it's in between the two lampposts, so it's not intermediate immediate light. So I pull the car in, launch into there, turn the car off, turn the lights off, get off the brake, and I push my mate's head down, like, just stay, stop. And we're just stuck there. In fact, we, I remember we were looking at each other, just in complete fear and intimidation, just locked eyes, wondering how we got into this. And then we heard this car go, vroom, fly by. And I'm playing this out. Like, this could go down two of, one of two ways. Either they could get down to the end, which is just beyond us, and they realise, huh, they've pulled into a car space. Let's just look for the Chiello with a ding in the bat, and we found them. Or the owner of the house who we've just launched into is going to come out and go, oi, what are you boys doing here? Get out of here. And then the guys are going to come up and going to find us and say, don't worry about that, sir. We'll take care of this. And we're still going to get the beat town of our lifetime. So this wasn't looking good. What seemed like 10 minutes was probably only two minutes. My mate and I have just locked eyes for the whole time. And I hear, again, another prompting, go. So I slowly turn the, the car on and I, I pull out, I leave the lights off and we start caressing ourselves back out of this little residential area. And the cars are going by us and I'm thinking, was that them, was that them? We made it to the end, we flew up towards the highway because I knew that if I could merge onto the highway into oncoming traffic, we'd be safe and clear. And so that's what we did and we, we made it out of there. We didn't get the beat down of our lifetimes. And that whole night, my mate and I just caressed and cuddled each other uh, until we went to sleep. Um, but looking back on that moment, 18 years on, now a mature, mostly, well-adjusted, mostly, contributing member of society, mostly, I had an epiphany. I realised that I was running. Not so much from a car full of adolescent, pubescent juveniles. I mean, I was, for sure, I was running for my life. But I was in that situation wrestling with those circumstances in that moment because I was running from God and I didn't even know it. I was running from a life-giving, life-changing, transforming relationship with Jesus that he had invited me into and the pursuit to see his kingdom come and his will be done in my life. And I was on the run. I was a runaway. I wonder, I wonder if we might have any runaways here this morning. Maybe you're watching online. See, running from God doesn't, it doesn't always look like a, a literal physical transfer from one place to the next. I mean, it can, and maybe it has for you. Maybe you've quit, uh, maybe you've moved cities or quit jobs or changed churches or severed a relationship with someone who was a source of accountability in your life to avoid what God had called you to or what he had begun to develop in you. And so maybe for you, it, it has been a literal run. But running from God can also just simply be the distance that we create in our hearts between our desires and the person and things of God. It might be a cognitive choice, like a clear intentional choice 
to run from God? Like maybe you know for certain that God has called you to a certain ministry or vocation or people or people group to be a sign, image and foretaste for the kingdom of God. Maybe he challenged you to reconcile a relationship that had become uh, fractured because uh, broken because of some sort of offense or prompted you to, to stand up for injustices in your workplace um, or in your school or whatever it might have been, but it, it just seemed too hard or too scary or you felt incompetent or unqualified and so you just made a quick beeline for the exit door. And sometimes, though, running from God can look more like a, sm- a slow drift, not a willful, conscious act to turn from God, but neither was there any attempt to stay close and live a a life marked by His kingdom and the presence of His Holy Spirit. And that's what we were trying to um, cultivate here within the church for these last 21 days of fasting and prayer, and I hope that it has um, set something, been a catalyst for you in your own heart. Because here's the thing, if we're not intentional, if we're not proactive in this space, and this is how quick it happens, little by little we start to let go. We stop pursuing God. We start to turn from His Word and then we turn from His instruction. We, we, we ignore His plan and His will for our lives and then we slip out of the community of believers here in the church and right out the back door. Amen. And then guess what? We start to follow the pattern of the world rather than being transformed into the image of our glorious King Jesus. And often we don't even realize we've switched tracks until before long we, we feel more distant than God from God than ever before. Hey, I wonder if we have any runaways in the church this morning. Have you got any drifters that drifted on by? Maybe you're watching online. If you just started to get a little bit nervous in your seat, if you're getting a little bit uncomfortable, you feel the conviction in your heart, maybe God is trying to get your attention this morning. But if that's you, I have good news. And that is that you're not alone. In fact, you are in quite stellar company because the prophet Jonah has already traversed that tumultuous terrain and sensationally live to tell the tale. No doubt many of us have heard the story of Jonah, um, but my guess is you've probably only heard the PG version, not the Pastor George version, maybe you have, but the parental guidance version, the version that they teach us in Sunday school. You know how Jonah ran away from God, got swallowed by a big fish, then he comes to his senses and then he fulfills God's mission and sees miraculous repentance on a scale that would make Billy Graham's jaw drop to the floor. And that's all true. There's actually more to the story that perhaps that you and I haven't considered. And so I thought that today we'd hop aboard Jonah's runaway tale and we'd stop off every now and then to check out the sites and make a few observations and see what God might have to teach you and I this morning. Does that sound all right? You on board? Did I make it exciting? All right, did my job. Uh, initially, this was going to be a one-part series, a one, or what, just one sermon, but man, I got to the third part of Jonah's story and it was a cracker, like there was stuff going on. I just, to do it justice, I had to cut in two. So today is going to be a good foundation for, for the second part, uh, but it's going to be good nonetheless. Um, do you mind if I pray? Just invite God here. I mean, He is, but I want Him to do something. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are in our midst this morning. And Lord, I just pray that even now that Your Spirit would be going out over the people here, that you'd be stirring their hearts, that you'd be challenging their desires and their affections. Lord, that you would become real to us this morning, that you would illuminate your word, that they would be more than just my own, but that your Holy Spirit would go forth in power. In Jesus' name, amen. So the story of Jonah is not the only place, actually not the only place in the Bible uh, that, that the notable prophet makes an appearance. Jonah lived during the time of King Jeroboam II. I had to put an American accent on to get that out. Jeroboam II, who was the the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time, during a politically prosperous season for Israel, but a spiritually dark period. In fact, Jonah's mentioned in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14, if you want to check it out, for correctly prophesying God's divine, miraculous assistance in the reacquisition of previous lost territories to their enemies. All that to say that Jonah is a big shot, big time prophet with a credible reputation as a servant of God. And by the time we meet him in his self-titled book, Jonah, he's a little bit older in age, not quite a pensioner, but not quite a spring chicken, kind of somewhere in between and probably living his best life. And the story opens straight to the good stuff with a call from God. Let's check it out. God says to Jonah, you might have to go there for me, handsome, because, yeah, there you go. I'll try and get this going in the meantime. God says to Jonah, get up, 
Like Jonah was sleeping or something. Like I told you he was living his best life. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now, a quick one-minute history lesson around Nineveh, which will give us, some, give us some critical context before we go forward. Nineveh was a great city of Assyria. That might ring a bell if you're familiar with the Old Testament Bibles, because Assyria were stark enemies to Israel, Jonah's people. They were, as God said, a wicked people, but that really doesn't cover the totality of it. The Assyrians were infamous for the... the, the um, sadistic violence that they had um, shown towards prisoners of war. Their brutality and their cruelty was legendary. They would impale their enemies on stakes in front of their own cities and then hang their heads from the trees in the king's gardens. They tortured their captives, men, women, and even children. They would hack off noses or fingers or ears. They would gouge out eyes or rip off lips. They had mastered the art of flame which is the process of skinning someone alive. They reportedly covered the city walls with the skins of their victims. Like, if you were to think about the people in your life right now who have offended you or hurt you, it's likely that they've got nothing on the Assyrians. This was a bad people group. So bad that it actually gets God's attention. He says to Jonah, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and announce announce my judgment against it because I've had enough. I've seen enough, it's time to deal with this. And Jonah says, no, like, uh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And he just flat out refuses. Actually, if we're going to be true to to the story, he actually doesn't say anything. He just ignores God and goes on the run. But there's more behind Jonah's decision that isn't immediately clear to us as the reader until we get a little bit further on in the story. We'll pick up a lot of that in part two of this. And so Jonah goes on the run. Like, quite literally, he runs down to the port of Joppa, which was an ancient port in, the, in Israel at the time, and, and he just finds a ship. Like, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no thought-out plan. He just finds a ship that's heading towards Tarshish, and he pays a, a fare, and he hops aboard. Now, to give us a little bit of bearings on the geography and what's going on here, from where Joppa is in the port of Joppa, Nineveh, where God has called him to go, is 500 miles north and a little bit west on the same piece of landmass that Jonah's currently standing. So with a good pair of leather sandals, maybe a backup pair, he can walk it. It's believed that the ancient port in Tarshish, where uh, Jonah's actually going, is 2,500 miles across the Mediterranean Sea in almost the opposite direction. Jonah has absolutely no other reason to make this long, costly, and back then risky voyage other than his disobedience and cold-heartedness towards God. Let me give you three takeaways at this point in the story uh, that we'll begin to see unfold as we get going. The first two are free, but you're going to have to pay for the third, okay? I think that's fair. (laughs) Someone's like, oh, that's all right. Uh, Yeah, handsome, go to the next slide for me. Sorry, I should call you Ken. It's probably more appropriate. Nope. Next one? Yes. Running from God will often cause us to make regretful and costly choices for our lives. Anyone experienced that already? A few times? You can go to the next one again, Ken. Proverbs 4, 18 through 19 says, The way of the righteous is like the first gleam, sorry, back one, back two now, is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness, they have no idea what they're stumbling over. <laughs> I love that. They have no idea. Like, have you ever noticed in people's lives, they're just continually falling down? Like, they just keep running into road bumps in their lives. And you can so, see so clearly from the outside looking in, but they've got no idea how they keep falling short. This exactly tells us why. Number two, sorry if you flick towards two now, Ken, and then we should be good in. One more, brother. Yeah. Number two, disembarking from God's plan or moral will for our lives will lead us to fruitless endeavours. What's Jonah going to do in Tarshish? What, what are you going to do there, Jonah? You're in a foreign country amongst a foreign people, you've got no support network, and you've just blown a load of cash to get there. Like, what are you thinking, Jonah? Outside of the wisdom of God, dumb ideas always make sense. That's good, that should have been my fourth point. 
Outside of the wisdom of God, dumb ideas always make sense. Number three, this is the one someone doesn't want to pay for. Following Jesus, we'll get this. Following Jesus and reorienting our lives around Him and His kingdom won't always be the easy part. But it will always lead to the most fruitful places in our lives. Hallelujah. I'm in the right place this morning. You know, oftentimes when we think about what it means to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and unreservedly, we can think on an epic scale, you know, like healing the sick or or prophesying over people or calling a, a community to repentance. But sometimes following Jesus might just mean maintaining integrity within our finances or within our business and our workplace or being faithful in a relationship or overlooking a wrong and extending forgiveness instead of repaying evil for evil. <laughs> like my little baseball bat story. You know, following Jesus and reorienting our lives around Him and His kingdom won't always be the easy path, but you can be sure it will always lead to the most fruitful places in our lives. Hey, I wonder if you're following Jesus this morning. Does your life revolve around Him? Is He truly at the center? Are you headed in His direction? I could ask it like this. Are you headed to Nineveh this morning? Or are you, have you set sail to Tarshish? Maybe you set sail to Tarshish years ago and you're wondering where God is in your life. And you're saying things like, man, I just don't hear Him anymore. I don't sense His presence anymore. Like I don't have a passion for, for God and His kingdom that I used to have. You're wondering, where is God in my life? Listen, I'm Ryan and I'm your friend. I love how John Maxwell says that. Can I tell you? God's in Nineveh, wondering what you're doing all the way over there in Tarshish. Why don't you come back this morning? But Jonah, he's figuring out this, he's figuring all this out in real time. Like, he, he hadn't written the story yet. This is, I mean, this is live to Jonah, and, but he's about to get an advanced lesson. Bobbing away out there in the Mediterranean Ocean, God hurls a powerful storm out to sea and over the ship that is so uh, significant, it, th- it threatens to tear the ship in two. Why would God do that? Like, is that God's holy anger? Anne might have a few ideas. Sorry, cut you off, sister. Yeah, yeah, amen. Could be, yeah. Get attention. Ooh, this, this girl's got it. She knows what she's on about. Because here's the thing, God cares for Jonah. God loves Jonah like he loves you this morning. And he knows that if Jonah continues on his current direction, it won't lead to anywhere fruitful or good in his life because there is no good outside of God. Can anyone say amen to that? Proverbs fourteen twelve. I don't know. I'm nearly there, I think. Let me find it. Yes, there it is. Proverbs 13, 12. Here we go. This is good. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. You know, like the relationship you get in with someone becomes romantic. You've only been dating a little while. Despite all the warnings and the flags, you continue because it seems right it feels right and then very quickly you realize no not right seems right i think is the equivalent to the australian she'll be right mate (laughs) anyone know that one you know are you sure that moving in together right now been dating a couple weeks is the right thing to do seems right yeah she'll be right do you really think continuing in this destructive habit for your life is going to lead anywhere good ah it's just a season yeah she'll be right mate Do you think dropping that amount of cash on that investment right now is the right course of action? Yeah, it seems right. She'll be right, mate. Everything's going up. Really? Have you... you, Okay, have you prayed about it? No. Have you invited the Holy Spirit to speak into your life? The Holy who? Oh, yes. Um, No. But I've got a good feeling about this. If anyone says to you, I've got a good feeling about this, run. Run. Run in the other direction. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. This is the path that Jonah is on. And hey, maybe you're on this morning. And so God sends a little turbulence over his life to, thank you, Anne, get his attention. The ship is full of pagan sailors who, fearing for their lives, uh, begin to pray to their gods and they throw the anchor down and they start hurling their precious cargo overboard as a way to steady and lighten the ship. 
At one point, the captain races below deck where he finds Jonah. And what do you think Jonah's doing down there? Praying, hiding. No, Jonah's asleep. He is passed out, comatose drool coming down the side of his mouth. It says, the Bible says the captain has to shake him awake. And he says to him, what are you doing, man? Like, how can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he can save us. Jonah's like, oh, if only you knew. And so he probably wipes the sleep out of his eyes and he climbs up aboard deck. And there he finds the sailors and they've just cast lots. It's a thing they used to do back in the day when... They, when calamity was upon the people, they used to think, well, we'll find out who's responsible by throwing lots and the gods will determine who it lands on, right? And that's who's responsible. And so Jonah gets on, up on deck and, and these sailors have just thrown lots and they all fall at Jonah's feet. Oops, wrong time to come up. And they all just stare at him. Like, and they start demanding, asking him, like, who are you? Where are you from? What, what, what nationality are you? And Jonah's quite truthful in the moment, surprisingly. And he responds, I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite, a child of God. I serve the Lord God, the God of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the land and the sea. And at this, the sailors become fear-stricken. And they start pleading with him, why, why did you bring this upon us? But Jonah's like, hey, don't worry. We can sort this out. He says, if you just pick me up and hurl me into the ocean, everything will be okay. Amazingly, Jonah happens to get on the only ship with pagan sailors who actually hold the sanctity for human life. And so they go below deck and they start rowing all the harder to try and get through the storm, but to no avail. And eventually they get on their own knees and they pray to Jonah's God. Hallelujah. And they say, Lord, please don't hold this against us. And they pick Jonah up and they hurl him into this raging storm. Remember, Jonah... He doesn't know what's about to happen. He doesn't know how the story's about to unfold. He's experiencing this in real time. And there he is somewhere out there in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean. No land or sea, in, uh, no land or, or other ships in sight. No idea how he's going to get out of there. Every idea how he got there. And then he feels a little bit of a tickle under his foot. I don't know, this is in the Bible. I'm just drawing conclusions here. And then he... He sees this dark mass start to emerge in the waters beneath him. And Jonah says to himself, crikey, what was that? It's the Australian version of Jonah. All at once, a giant fish breaches the surface of the water and gobbles Jonah up whole like a multivitamin. Like no chewing, no chomping, just straight swallow. I mean, I don't know if you remember the kids' church version, you got the pictures, like you always see Jonah in the belly of the fish and it's like this large open space, like the penthouse suite or something. And he's got like an orthopedic mattress sitting there and a, and a bedside table and a lamp on reading his Bible. But that's not the reality. He just got swallowed by a fish. He probably begins to slide down its digestive track. You know, it's slippery, it's slimy, slimy, it's nasty, it smells, there's seaweed wrapping around his head. There's probably other things swimming around in there, who knows? But eventually he ends up in its belly. (laughs) This is insane. This is incredible. Jonah's probably thinking to himself, man, if I ever get out of here, ain't no one is going to believe this. And there he is in the belly of the fish. And it's there that Jonah begins to assess his life's choices. Like if a situation like that doesn't cause you to rethink a few decisions in life and to do a little self-reflection, like ain't nothing is going to do it for you. And Jonah... He's probably thinking to himself, well, I earned this, right? I, I turned from God. I, I, ran, I ran from Him. This is God's judgment. This is His holy wrath. But what Jonah is about to realize is that God would, had sent the fish for his salvation. God sent the fish to save him. Maybe, maybe you're in a bind in your own life right now, like Jonah, at least metaphorically speaking. Or maybe you are in a fish somewhere out there at Main Beach watching this on YouTube in your last remaining battery life. Clearly anything is possible. But wherever you find yourself, you're in circumstances um, which are a result of your own choices to turn from God and His good and righteous ways. Can I tell you something? Even now, you are not out of God's reach. Even now, wherever you are, God is still mighty to save. 
Jonah's been there. Jonah is there in the belly of the fish, and he has a prodigal son moment. I don't know if you're familiar with the story where the son comes to his father well before time, and he says, hey, I want my inheritance. Cash me out. And the loving father complies, and he gives him a wad of cash, and the son goes off into the city, and he squanders everything, just spends it all on frivolous living. And he, and he ends up in a pig pen, eating the scraps of the fish. And the Bible says this beautiful phrase that the young son comes to his senses. That's so powerful. He comes to his senses. A moment of grace, a moment of acceptance and repentance of our own choices. And likewise, Jonah comes to his senses. He accepts ownership of the choice that he made to turn from God, despite a lifetime of God's faithfulness in his own life. And he prays a concession of short yet spirited prayers of praise towards God. Here's a little snippet in Jonah 2.7. Jonah says, As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. Do you, do you feel like your life is slipping away? Maybe I feel like maybe there's someone watching online. Like no matter how hard you try to hold on to it, to, con- to control all the variables within your life, your, your finances, your work, your relationships... No matter how hard you try, it's just like sand slipping through your fingers. Jesus said, Matthew 16, I know you all know it. He said, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but forfeit your own soul? If anything is worth worth more than your soul? That is such a good question that we would do well to think and ask ourselves regularly. Is anything in my life that I give all this effort and attention to, is it worth more than my eternal soul? Jesus is trying to push home the message that this life is temporary. It's fleeting. It can be beautiful and full of beautiful moments. But over-investing in temporal things to the neglect of our eternal reality, well, that's a bad trade. And it's why it's so important that we as Christians maintain an eternal perspective, holding tightly to the promises of God so that we're not influenced or derailed by short-term problems. Does anything in my life, when you just ask yourself, does anything in my life truly hold more significance than my eternal position, my eternal destination? You you might not be in the belly of a fish this morning, but maybe you're in a place physically or mentally or spiritually or emotionally that feels isolated and dark and distant from God. You've made decisions in your life to turn left when God was leading you right. If that's you, if your life has slowly been slipping away like sand through your fingers, won't you come to your senses this morning and turn back to God. Jonah prays near the end in Jonah 2.9, but I will offer sacrifices to you, God, with songs of praise. I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. If you're looking for salvation this morning, if you need rescuing, saving, your salvation will come from God alone. Turn back to Him. Turn your heart's affections and your thoughts towards Him. Let songs of praise flow through your mouth. Recommit your life to Jesus and His kingdom because He alone holds your glorious salvation. Mine too. At that prayer, God orders the fish to spit Jonah out. He just spits him out. But this is how good God is. That while Jonah was in the belly of the fish, slowly coming to his senses, God had already made a plan. God had already redirected the fish back towards his plan and promises for Jonah's life. It turns out that the fish spat Jonah. I've read a lot of commentaries on this. They believe that the fish, the the fish, that's a cool word. The fish spits Jonah out, not somewhere in the middle middle of the Mediterranean Ocean where he's eventually going to get exhausted and drown, a slow and horrible death, but the fish spits Jonah out near the shoreline, uh, close by to an ancient path that led right to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh. (laughs) Thanks, Anne. Here's another point if you're taking notes. When we come to our senses and turn back to God, 
He redeems our past and he sets us in the right direction. It's true of my life. Maybe you've convinced yourself this morning that you, you deserve to be where you are. The predicament, the circumstances that you're facing, the hardship that you're in right now, this is God's holy judgment against you. Like it's only fair. God's a holy God. He has a right to hold judgment over your life. And maybe it was your choices that led you to where you are. But listen, if Jonah taught us anything, it's this. God's more interested in getting us back than paying us back. You know how I know that? Because Jesus has already taken the punishment for our sins. In Christ, we have been freed from the penalty of our sins, free to live by the power of His name and into a life shaped by the pursuit to see His kingdom come and His will be done in our lives. We're not just called to go to heaven one day. We're called to bring heaven to every place we see hell here. What an awesome mandate. Advocates of Jesus Christ. There is no greater calling. I don't care what you do. You're a mechanic, you're a teacher, musician, a teacher. I think I said that one. Any of the other vocations. Your highest calling is to be an advocate of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So hold that mandate well. But following Jesus and reorienting our lives around Him won't always be the easy path, but it will always lead to the most fruitful places in our lives. Which direction are you headed this morning? Like, I just want to pump the brakes here for a second and just, just give the Holy Spirit a moment right now. Just a moment of humility to allow God to do that in your heart, to, to come to your senses if that's you this morning. Like, ask honestly, am I headed in His direction? Is there any area of my life that I need to surrender in obedience to Christ to see a greater reflection of Him in it? I love uh, the psalm of King David, who was said to be a man who had a heart after God's own heart. And he says this amazing prayer. He says, search me, O God. Search me. Like, if you're on the run, you, ain't, you don't want no one to search you. You, like, you want to be out there by yourself, isolated, don't come near me, I don't want to expose what's really going on beneath the surface. But David says, search me, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path to Nineveh, to everlasting life. I wonder if you need to make a course adjustment this morning. God wants to get you back without paying you back. You're not too far from His reach. And I believe, like Jonah, that when we turn to God and we start heading in His direction, He can redeem your past and set you on the right direction.